Hello and welcome to the 538 Politics Podcast. I'm Galen Druk. It's been four weeks since the election, and the full results, particularly in down-ballot races, have come into greater focus. Democrats fell short, and Republicans exceeded expectations down-ballot. Democrats will maintain control of the House, of course, but they netted a loss of at least seven seats. They lost 10 and gained three, and at best they could tie in the Senate. They also lost almost all of the competitive state legislative races that they hoped would help them take full or partial control of state governments. So what happened down ballot? We're going to dig into that today. And then also, we're going to ask one of our favorite questions, good use of polling or bad use of polling, pertaining to 2024 Republican primary polling. Here with me to do all of that is Editor-in-Chief Nate Silver. Hey, Nate. Hey, Galen. Also here with us is Senior Politics Writer Claire Malone. Hey, Claire. Hi, Galen. And senior politics writer Perry Bacon Jr. Hey, Perry. Hi, Galen. Everyone have a good Thanksgiving. Get to relax, eat plenty, and recover from the election. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a... Four, I mean, it felt a little weird this year. Yeah, uh, that's right. It was just like a four-day weekend. That was good, though. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully, you know, we keep getting good news on this these vaccines and we will, you know, have a normal Thanksgiving next year along with Party it hopefully up, many other 2021. experiences. I know, <laughs> yeah. things to look forward to. Thanksgiving 2021. Uh, let's dig into our favorite question. Good use of polling or bad use of polling? And this suggestion comes from a listener. So don't blame me if you think it's too soon to talk about 2024. Uh, A Politico morning consult poll released last week showed President Trump leading the pack of potential Republican presidential primary candidates. He received majority support at 53 percent. Next was Mike Pence at 12 percent. And then third was Donald Trump Jr. at 8 percent. Everyone else. So, you know, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, Mitt Romney, Nikki Haley, all those folks were all below 5 percent support. So. First of all, is this a good or bad use of polling in the sense of, is it too early to be polling the 2024 Republican primary when, you know, the current Republican president is still in the White House? Yes. No. (laughs) Perry, you're the tiebreaker here. I mean, to give a non-answer, the New York Times shouldn't do it. Politico should. That's sort of what they do. So I, I think it's not a great use for ABC News. I wouldn't advocate us doing it. But I think for a website this devoted to sort of political intrigue like Politico, I think it's fine. But that's like, but that's offering, but, but, but like accuracy wise or like projection wise, it sounds like you're saying, eh, it's not that useful, but it's useful for Politico to gin up content. No, well... I don't think it's a great in a sort of small D democratic discourse to discuss polling before <laughs> the, the the previous race is really over in, you know, like, okay, it's just too early in a small D. But no, I actually think in terms of what it does, it tell, does it tell us something about the Republican Party? Yes, it does. One thing it tells us is that a lot of the people we've talked about and I think about Tom Cotton, Mike Pompeo. A lot of those people, it's not they have little support, it's that most Republican voters have probably never heard of them. Their name ID is very low, and name ID does matter. And I think it does mean, if you're some of these people, if Donald Jr. is ahead of you, it means Donald Jr. is heard of by more people. And getting name ID up is not not the easiest thing. This is something that Scott Walker and people like that struggle with in 2016. So I think that is an issue. And two, it tells us that even though Donald Trump lost, a large majority, a large block of the Republican Party is open to him being the candidate again. I don't think when Romney lost in 2012, I don't know what the comparative number was, but I doubt there was a great industry to have Romney run again versus Trump has signaled he will consider running again. And a lot of Republicans are open to that. And that's useful information, at least from my point of view. All right. So, Claire, why is this a bad use of polling? Uh, I think that you should uh, wait until... I think you should wait to trust numbers or to start thinking about these numbers until like after uh, the new president has been inaugurated. Once you kind of see what the landscape of the GOP is when Biden has been in office for a while. Um, I agree with Perry in some sense that like internally it's interesting that 
you know, these are who GOP voters know, but also that's pretty intuitive, right? That we that people know Don Jr. and that people know Trump because they're basically the entire, you know, force and, and uh, psychology of the Republican Party is sort of targeted towards those people and promoting those people. So, um, but who knows what the, what the landscape will be in, in six months. And I think that's, you know, a thing that we we have all probably learned over the past four years and particularly in the, in this past year itself is that like the landscape could look very different in six months. We'll have a, hopefully fingers crossed, knock on wood, all that jazz, um, COVID vaccine, you know, who knows what the political conversation will be focusing on. My guess is the economy. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, I don't think it's particularly useful in the long term. I guess is my thought on that. All right, Nate, you said it is a good use of polling unequivocally. It's so have at it. Completely great use of polling. <laughs> it's a great use. It's the best use of polling! Exclamation point. So let me let me make two points. Right. Um, one is that I'm not sure that the polls aren't a little bit predictive. I mean, when we've looked back and said, who is the early front runner in primary polls? That person wins reasonably often, actually. Um, now we're talking early, we mean like a year in advance <laughs> and not four years in advance. Um, but Joe Biden is someone who, if you had said um, in 2016 that the next primary will come down to Joe Biden versus Bernie Sanders, um, Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris do okay, but kind of have to bow out at some point. Like, that wouldn't have been surprising at all, right? Trump would have been surprising in 2016, but Clinton would obviously not have been right. Um, Mitt Romney would not have been surprising in 2012. Obama would have been mildly surprising in 2008, but he was considered a rising star, right? Um, so, you know, and Nate, I should add. Nay, I should add to this that actually I tried to dig up polling from the fall of 2016 to see what it showed of the Democratic primary. And I found a public policy polling poll that showed that Biden was leading with 30 percent support um, for the 2020 Democratic primary. So there you go. There you have it. But anyway, you're going to say empirically uh, what what this all shows. Um, But also it's, you know, so it's somewhat predictive for the future. Um, it's also kind of relevant for the present in terms of who has traction and who doesn't, right? Yeah, a lot of it's name recognition. Some of it is like, you know, but like a Tom Cotton, you know, if you kind of are reading press clippings about Tom Cotton, he's a pretty obscure figure. In my view, he's not very charismatic. Um, and that seems to be reflected in polls where people don't really have much an opinion about him. So, you know, because, look, among other things... You can see Trump's disputing the election results. That's putting too pretty a bow on it, right? But Trump making all these bullshit claims. You can partly see that as positioning for 2024, obviously, right? Is that all of it or most of it? I don't know. I mean, I think, I don't know what he really believes inside, right? But like, who is lining up on what side of that, right? Um, Can be like an early proxy for who do you support in, in 2024? At this point, do you all think we should expect Trump to run in 2024? Who knows what his appetite will be then? I mean, maybe he'll have a nice little niche carved out on, you know, OAN or or, or Newsmax. I mean, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, he's also a man in his mid-70s. Doesn't that play some <laughs> factor potentially? Uh, I would think yeah. so. And maybe it is too early to ask that particular question Um for sure. But Perry, what were you going to say? I tend to think somebody who like Trump, I'll assume he's running until he says he isn't running as opposed to the opposite. Like, you know, like Trump, Tom Cotton, Mike Pompeo, Marco Rubio, those Ted Cruz. I sort of assume Larry Hogan, that group of people like Kamala Harris. I tend to assume those people are running in 2024 unless I hear otherwise. And I think that's the right assumption about them. Oh, wait, you said, hold on, you like slipped in there at the end, Kamala Harris. So you're assuming that Kamala Harris will, quote unquote, run for Biden's second term, unless you hear that Biden himself is running. Yeah, right. I think it's if you're covering Kamala Harris starting tomorrow, I think you're in some ways, your baseline assumption would be more logical because it would make more sense to cover her. If she's not running, who cares? And you can, But if she is running, it would be a smart thing to start covering her, assuming this is a person who has a decent chance of running for president and who probably is, 
like when she announced her staff yesterday, some of her staff got announced, I read that more closely than if I would have read who's on Tim Kaine's staff or Hillary Clinton, because I don't think that really mattered that much. So, you know, so yeah, I do think that matters a little bit. I'm not predicting anything. I'm just saying, as a person who covers people, I sort of assume, like, I, I'm not assuming that... Um, Bernie Sanders is running in 2024. I don't think I have any reason to think that's likely at all. So he, you know, he may very well run in 2024, but there's no way for us to know at this point. How should, how is the Republican Party going to interact with him given that that's an unknown? Is he a competitor for the nomination? Is he still a leader or the leader of the party? You know, Beyond just the question of whether or not he'll run in 2024, clearly he has a lot of sway with those primary voters. Um, So what role does he take? Yeah, look, I mean, I think the GOP has an issue where they're kind of like um, a little bit damned if they do and damned if they don't, right? Um, They think, I mean, one thing people don't realize is like the fact that the GOP has um, lost the popular vote. And what is it now? Seven out of eight, 92, 96, 00, 04, 08, 12, 16, 20. Yeah, seven of eight um, elections, right? The one elect- Republican that got elected twice and won a popular vote. Um, plurality one year was George Bush, who is not particularly well regarded by history, right? So, like, they don't really have models of a successful Republican president apart from Reagan. And Reagan now is kind of a generation ago for, for people. Um, so, therefore, like, you know... They can't go back and say, oh, like Democrats would with Obama. Hey, Obama worked and Bill Clinton worked, right? So we want to be one of those things, right? The GOP doesn't really have that. Um, So they might say, okay, well, with Trump, we keep, you know, Trumpian politics, we keep the Senate. Maybe we'll win back the House in four years and we'll often lose the presidency, but we'll be competitive, right? Because of the Electoral College and this working class white coalition, you know, isn't so bad, right? Um, so usually when parties lose elections, even if they lose by narrow margins, like like John Kerry did, for example, right? No one said, oh, John Kerry performed well relative to the fundamentals, and that was a good, you know, a good thing for Democrats to emulate. They said, oh, no, we nominate another Northeastern liberal, and we need something different, right? Um, you don't have that process in the GOP. Whether that's smart on Trump's behalf or smart on Republicans' behalf, I don't know, right? But you, you don't have this shift so far that usually occurs after a candidate loses, Um and so, you know, in the long run, you would say that is potentially unhealthy for for A, for the GOP, and B, for American democracy, right? Because one thing is people react to losses and they iterate and change, and that's one way you go about kind of realigning the system. If that doesn't happen, then um, – and he wants to be Grover Cleveland, right, and have two non-consecutive terms, then it's a different era. Does it, I mean, so you basically described a situation where Republicans are not really considering taking another path away from Trumpism at this point. Does everyone agree with that? That it seems like, as far as President Trump's role in the party going forward, you know, he is the model, you know, maybe not him in his entirety, but like a rough approximation of his politics and strategy are the way forward for the Republican Party. And then he is either the next you know, candidate for president, or at least the kingmaker. Yeah, I think there's some level to that where where Trumpism works, where that style of politics works, and that people will probably continue to court it in some fashion for at least the next four years. I think that, you know, the next GOP primary will be interesting to see various people's interpretations on it. That's not to say that there won't be candidates who are offering themselves up as alternatives to that, you know, Hogan and and Haley, Haley to a lesser degree, being kind of examples of that, I think. So I guess, is Trump the leader of the Republican Party is, I guess, two questions. I guess one is, next July, if Biden is proposing something and the Senate is fighting about it and so on, It'll be hard to say Trump is like the leading voice of the Republican Party then, because I think, I assume, let's say Trump is calling in to Fox News to say Joe Biden's bill on this is stupid and so on, so on, and so on. 
it still is not the kind of role that Tom Cotton or Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy had. They'll actually be involved in the bill, opposing it. Like the real leader of the Republican Party, I think in 2021, will be Mitch McConnell because he'll actually be in a real governing role. This comparison isn't perfect, but I remember in 2009, when I worked at the Washington Post, we spent a lot of time covering what Sarah Palin was doing because she felt like the sort of like, you know, spiritual leader of the Republican Party. But it became more strained to cover that because there was a lot of big fights happening in Washington and Sarah Palin was on Fox News. She wasn't really in the midst of those debates. I don't think Trump is going to drive to the Capitol and meet with the Republican senators and be involved that way. So I'm not sure he'll be the leader in that way. Now, in terms of who's running for president, I think a sort of Trump, figure, but I think Greg Abbott and Ron DeSantis and Tom Cotton and Marco Rubio will all be trying to be Trump-like in different ways. But if everybody's become, if everybody's a Trumpist, then on some level, nobody's a Trumpist. It's like, that's not, if everybody's running on some version of Trumpism, it seems a little reductive to say everybody's running as a Trump. They're sort of running, maybe the Republican Party has a maybe Republicanism is sort of Trumpism and they're sort of running as different versions of that. Yeah, that's fair. So, all right. Uh, we dug a little deeper than just whether or not this is a good use of polling. But after that conversation, are we still divided? Um, we have a yes from Nate and no from Claire and a maybe from Perry. I'll go to yes. Good use You'll of polling. You'll go to yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, oh, okay. All right. Nate, you <laughs> won You won that battle. Um, Woo! Anyway, Politico Morning Console, uh, majority rules, and that is a good use of polling. Let's move on and talk about down-ballot races in the 2020 election. In the end, Biden's 2020 electoral map was a pretty decent performance for Democrats. While several states may have been closer than they would have hoped, Biden won back the blue wall states in the upper Midwest and expanded the map in the Sun Belt. He also won a record-breaking 80-plus million votes nationally. Democrats can't quite say the same down ballot. They were expected to pick up seats in the House, but instead lost a net of at least seven. They were favored to win control of the Senate. At best, they could tie and therefore have control of the Senate. Um, but that looks like an uphill climb. And they lost almost all of the state legislative races that were key to getting full or partial control of state governments, which is, of course, especially important heading into a redistricting year. This all happened during a deadly pandemic, an economic crisis, and an unpopular Republican president at the top of the ticket. So these results are a little confounding. Uh, Republicans exceeded expectations, Democrats underperformed. Maybe that is a little bit of why, as Nate was saying, Republicans aren't having a reckoning moment right now. So let's talk about what happened. And we're just going to begin there broadly, you know, what did happen? Why did Republicans exceed expectations and Democrats underperform? And All right, I'm going to be annoying. Jump in with the, you're going to disagree with my friend. That's fine. I think the friend, who the, I mean, we don't judge football games by who beats the point spread, right? Um, you know, I mean, there, but there are questions here. Questions are like, were expectations reasonable and correct. I mean, that's an interesting question for 538 to address since we do forecasting and stuff like that. Um, and I kind of go one branch at a time here. I think in the Senate, people's expectations were a little bit misaligned with actually kind of what um, the data said, right? Um, if you look at kind of our House model, there's a big range of seats, but there are a lot of outcomes where Democrats would a win 50 or 51, right? There were also outcomes where they would win more than that, right? But the center of the distribution was like kind of Democrats winning 50 to 52 seats. Now they wind up with between 48 and 50. So it's like, it's like, you know, there are all these races that look plausible, like South Carolina or Alaska or whatnot, but like, but not many of these Senate races individually were, were terribly major upsets, right? Um, well, of course, Iowa and Maine to a certain extent. The, First of all, our model had Gideon was only a 59% favorite in Maine. Joni Ernst was a 58% favorite in Iowa. So she, you know, that was correctly predicted, right? The biggest upsets in North Carolina were Cunningham was a 68% favorite, right? Um, but, you know, having a one in three chance is not really that big an upset. So, like, so I don't know. I think people, like, um, don't realize that, A, 
in a lot of these states, it was a very uphill battle for Democrats, like red states like South Carolina. B, also in some of these states, the polling kind of didn't finish as well for Democrats as it had been over parts of the summer. And so, like, so I just kind of object to the notion that, like, that the Senate was hugely surprising. Okay. I take that objection. And we've had this conversation to some extent before. And so I think that's important to say up front. However, we now have a situation where Joe Biden won the popular vote nationally handily. He had a pretty good map um, as far as the Electoral College goes. Yet, Dem- it looks like Democrats may well not take control of the Senate. They didn't, you know, if we look at redistricting this coming year, Republicans are going to have control over redistricting 43% of the seats, Democrats only 17% of the seats, of course, the rest uh, by commissions or, or whatnot. So, you know, regardless of what expectations were based on polling, et cetera, because we've already had that conversation to some extent, there is something going on here where Democrats can perform reasonably well nationally, but not do so well down ballot. Um, and and maybe that's the more interesting question or more the question that we want to get at in this conversation. Why is that? I mean, I'm trying to like, I'm actually trying to like count how many states that Joe Biden won, right? If you have two senators for every state and California counts the same as Wyoming, then that creates a pretty big disadvantage for Democrats. You know, I mean, you have very little split ticket voting anymore. The one Republican who benefited, benefited from it was um, Susan Collins. Biden actually won Maine by a fairly large margin. But I believe every other contest um, tracked with the presidential result, kind of leaving Georgia uncalled for now. Um, and so if that happens and you kind of have Republicans winning all these rural red states and having two senators from you know, Wyoming and Idaho and, and North Dakota and South Dakota and whatever else, right, then it becomes very hard for Democrats to um, to to win the Senate, um, even in a year that was kind of a landslide in the House for Democrats in 2018, Democrats actually lost seats in the Senate. Um, so that just makes kind of life fairly tough for for Democrats. Um, now, there was a little bit of underperformance. It looks like Democrats will kind of wind up winning the U.S. House popular vote by around three points versus four and a half points for Biden, roughly, in the presidential vote. Um, so that means that, like, you know, to the extent there is some ticket splitting, that there are some people who would not indulge and abide by Trump, but who would um, vote for maybe more moderate Republicans or less Trumpy Republicans down ballot. Um, but, you know, but a lot of this has to do with the fact that, like, um, structurally, it's tough for Democrats to to win the Senate, given that, you know, each state has equal numbers of senators. So I was going to cite that popular vote number because I think that's important to come to, which is that in 2018, the the national House race margin, Democrats won by about 8.6 points, almost nine points. Versus in 2020, as Nate said, Biden only won by Biden won by four, so less than nine, and the Democrats won by three, so in re, by three overall in the House race. So in some ways, the the overall Democratic margin was just much smaller, even at the presidential level. 2018 was a big Democratic win. 2020, the presidential level and the House level was less of a Democratic win. Uh, Ron Brownstein did a quite a good piece in the Atlantic, and his estimate is the Democrat Joe Biden won about 223. It might go up to 225 House districts. So meaning that Biden it wasn't like Biden over exceeded the the vote by that much. So if you're 225 for Biden, the House Democrats look like they'll get about between. 223, 225, they'll get the same number of House seats. Part of the issue you're seeing is the number of split ticket voting in all these races is getting much smaller. Like Nate said, the only Senate Senate place where we have a where we have a presidential race went one way and the Senate went another way so far is Maine. Like that's one state that had a difference in the results between president and Senate in terms of who won. At the House level, it looks like we're going to have the lowest number of sort of seats where the one party won the presidential and one party won the House and ever before. It looks like, per Brownstein's count, you'll have about 10 districts where Trump won, but there's a Democrat, and about 10 districts where Biden won, but there's a Republican. So about 20 total split districts. So in a certain way, what you're seeing is the Democratic underperformance was in a lot of ways just the Democratic performance of the presidential level and the House level aligning really strongly. And the way we are now is that's that doesn't create a very large 
Democratic majority versus in 2018, the Democrats won a lot of seats in Trump country, probably seats they were always going to have a hard time retaining. Is maybe a way to put it, and I think maybe Brownstein sort of says this, is that um, some of these results, you know, the lack of ticket splitting is just people sort of um, further falling into those, I guess, geographical categories of uh, Republicans win rural or exurban places and Democrats win cities and suburbs. Because I think that's 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 sort of the, the qualitative point that people, I think, are starting to, to talk about, which is um, why can't Democrats hold on to some of these um, reddish places or purplish places, once purplish places? I mean, Perry brought, but like, look, Democrats came in an environment where they won the House popular vote by nine points in 2018. Um, but a midterm is different. In a midterm, you don't worry about ticket splitting because there's no presidential race in a midterm. So you can't have a little bit more crossover voting. Obviously, turnout, although turnout was very high in 2018 relative to other midterms, much lower than in a presidential year. Um, so, you know, in some ways, you can kind of say, okay, how are the Democrats doing in the House as compared to 2016, which is the last presidential year? And they've gained a ton of seats relative to 2016. Um, you know, you don't own a House seat, you lease it, you have it for two years. And in an era where there's weak incumbency, um, then, you know, there's no particular advantage um, to having been the previous occupant of that seat when you have a new election. And so, you know, um, you know, look, in some ways, if you have this shift from Democrats winning the popular vote by nine to three, in some ways, they're fortunate not to have lost more seats. When we talk about this big state, small state and rural state, urban state divide, there are a lot of examples that kind of frustrate this and the Democrats have plenty of senators that come from small states like Rhode Island or Vermont. Um, and then you also see, you know, these big pretty urbanized, pretty diverse uh, states like Texas and Florida that have no Democratic senators whatsoever. Um, is that like, is this just too easy uh, to like for Democrats to just blame it on the system and the and the structure of two senators per state and not something that is like a, a deeper challenge for Democrats? I mean, it's a, ch it's a challenge for Democrats, but no, I think, I think people radically underestimate how important the structural factors are, right? And it's seen as like, oh, partisan whining by Democrats if they complain about it, right? Um, but like the median Senate seat is something like six points more Republican than the country overall, right? That's just a hugely consequential factor. And by the way, it's not the small states. I mean, there are um, these blue-leaning small states in New England and Hawaii is another one, right? Um, that's actually not the issue mathematically. The issue is that you have these giant states that are are very blue and you get diminishing returns, right? California, New York, Illinois, right? New Jersey. Um, these are all very populous states and Democrats are maxed out in kind of how many centers they can have from them. Okay, so then what, you know, obviously uh, the Senate is not going to be abolished and the two parties have to operate within the current system as it stands. It looks unlikely right now that in the near term, uh, Democrats are going to have the ability to add D.C. or Puerto Rico as states. Who knows? Um, so is this a problem of Democrats coalition? And if so, what can they do to, you know, be more competitive in House and Senate seats and particularly Senate seats? It's a tricky problem for them. I mean, I think a lot of um a lot of liberal ideas are popular, right? People do generally like the idea of, you know, government health care programs, things like that, right? There are, um, you know, in, in, in times like right now, people like the idea of maybe getting um, a stimulus check or some sort of relief, you know, a pandemic relief check, things like that. Um, I do think that the Democrats face an interesting problem that's born of their broad coalition, which is um, the ideas being put forth by activists on the left are very new and very paradigm shifting to fund the police, things like that. Um, 
you know, the, the rise of the term socialism. And frankly, in, in polling that we've seen, younger people thinking that socialism is a better system than capitalism. You know, you can look at Pew and Gallup surveys and see stuff like that. Um, and, and so we, we have, uh, you know, in our national conversation, an annoying term, but one that, <laughs> that suits here, we've really spent a lot of time talking about those ideas. And they are um, exciting ideas to people. Um, but also alienating ideas and alienating ideas or things that make people angry or gin up strong emotions come to, I think, particularly right now in the sort of media age that we have, um, dominate a conversation, even if, you know, even if probably the majority of American cities won't defund the police or, you know, radically change its structure, whether or not you think that's good or bad. And I do think that, the you know, the Democrats have some some problem of, um of perception by certain people. And I, and, you know, it's interesting in, in, I think we'll probably get into this in this conversation where, you know, some people from the DCCC are saying, or some activists on the democratic side of things are saying, you know, we should have gone out and done more canvassing, but people kept on telling us, no, there's a pandemic. We can't, you know, we can't do that. It's a bad example, things like that. You know, that has become this cultural thing that irritates people, right? The, the, um, the nervous Nelly liberal who says you can't leave your house because of the pandemic, even though, you know, life goes on and people have jobs that they need to do work. It, it, like, I think that if that becomes the pre prevailing message of, you know, why did Democrats lose in certain um, house districts, it does kind of play into the stereotype of liberals. And that's like a broader conversation about, you know, um, liberals sitting inside and worrying and telling you everything that's wrong with the world, but not really providing any kind of solutions or leadership. And I think that there is a certain cultural perception of, of the party um, right now in this moment. How are other people thinking of, you know, Democrats, how, you know, given the structures that Democrats have to work within to try to, you know, win power in American government, what kind of specific challenges do they face and, and how do they go about them? Parody your thoughts on this? Uh, I mean, I guess part of it might be that it looks like a, a little less than half the country is Republicans and like 45 to 48 percent, 47 percent, and a little more than half the country is Democrats, but not a not a hugely, you know, not a huge disparity. And that's kind of what we're getting, which is these really close races where things are really divided. So the, the, the Democrats need more white voters without college degrees. The Republicans need more people of color. Neither party's changing the, the fundamental dynamics that much. I don't know that I would say either party's failing in, or either party's succeeding because they're both sort of in this kind of trench war where neither one's getting the, sort of a real advantage. So I'm not. So that's kind of where it's like, I feel like, yeah, people have sorted themselves into these parties based on geography, urbanization, cultural values, race, religion. And I'm not sure I, yeah, I just, I don't know that I see either party being able to break the stalemate in the short term. Yeah, I, look, I think one thing that makes it hard for Democrats is, um, I mean, Democrats have always been the larger, maybe not always, <laughs> but recently, right, have been the larger and more diverse party. And I don't just use diverse is a euphemism for racially diverse, but like, you know, there were a broader range of ideologies within the Democratic Party, some, you know, Joe Manchin, almost conservative members, some obviously very liberal members, right? It's a party that can accommodate AOC and Joe Manchin, for example, right? I don't know if you could find people that are that opposed within the GOP, although maybe you go to Larry Hogan or something. Um, you know, if you're in an environment where elections are more nationalized now, um, then what AOC says can get Joe Manchin in trouble or vice versa. Um, and that makes it tough for Democrats to kind of hold on with these moderate kind of folksier, more rural Democrats, right? There are very few of them left anymore. Um, and so that just kind of makes the brutal reality of the math, I think, a lot a lot harder for Democrats. Um, we'll see. I mean, they did have a very good midterm in 2018. Um, maybe the party can hope that, hey, when Trump is not on the ballot, then you have all these unpopular ideas in Trumpism, but you don't have the motivation and the turnout, and so therefore Democrats do well. I mean, that story is kind of complicated by the fact that turnout was really high on both sides in 2018, right? Although lower than 2020. Um, but we'll see. You know, I'm not necessarily convinced of much of anything, right? I'm not necessarily convinced that 
the 2022 midterm will be a big game for the GOP like you've had in the past, right? Especially if they kind of still control the Senate and still wield a lot of power, right? It might be different than it would be ordinarily. Um, but no, I don't think there are any like super obvious solutions for Democrats, except to, you know, frankly, like if you need to win, you know, all these red rural states, and I guess you would have an agenda that um, became more conservative, especially on issues that people in cities care about, right? Um, and that's the kind of sacrifice that Democrats would have to make that Republicans don't as much. To zone in on two races just briefly, I mean, when I look at this election, I think of the place where I thought Democrats could do well, but the nationalization I think matters is they had Steve Bullock, who's won, I think, four statewide elections in Montana, pretty charismatic guy, good candidate, you know, runs a good campaign, runs the center, loses and loses pretty badly to Steve Daines, kind of generic Republican. That tells me if politics is nationalized, I think it's hard for Steve Bullock to win a race in Montana, even though he's a great candidate, you know, and I would argue a really, really good candidate. So that's the place where it matters. On the other hand, if I'm looking for a place Democrats should have won, you got to look at Maine, where Joe Biden won by, I think, uh, Biden won by nine points in Maine, and the Sarah Gideon, the Democratic candidate, lost by eight. And that goes to Susan Collins being a good politician, but it also goes to that's the place where you, if, if politics is more nationalized, Democrats have to win House and Senate races where the, where, where the lean is much to their side. And that is the kind of loss that really does matter in the kind of place you have to think about what did Sarah Gideon do wrong or what did Susan Collins do right? Because that's the state the Democrats have to win. Right. I think this gets at the question, too, of where, you know, of course, in the what are Democrats doing right or wrong? What are Republicans doing right or wrong? Does it have more to do with ideology or strategy? Uh, And we've heard both arguments in the aftermath of this election. Uh, Do we have any sense of what the answer is? Maybe it's a third one, which is messaging, which is that the ideology is fine. Some of the policies are really popular, particularly some of the economic ones or healthcare ones. Um, maybe the strategy is off. But I, I guess going back to messaging, um, you know, a lot of the voters who form the base of the Democratic Party or, or um, are voters that they need to win over, including minority voters, are more moderate than, you know, the people, the white college educated people who um, tend to be vocal in, I would say, so, like certain policy making corners, in um, certain fundraising corners. So I think it's some of it's like, you know, Bernie Sanders after the 2016 primary did this interesting, sorry, 2016 race, did this interesting thing of um, backing mayors and, you know, state level candidates who were more, who were economically progressive, but had some socially conservative um, issue stances. And that got him a lot of flack from particularly um, the abortion rights part of the party and kind of spoke, I think, classically to the, to the big tent problem of the party. But I don't think he was wrong in, in sussing out that the economic and healthcare policies are, are, are popular with people if, if sort of presented in a certain way. There are also a lot of Democrats who had convinced themselves that things are popular when they aren't <laughs> necessarily, right? In that if they just kind of frame things differently or, or I don't know. Again, it's an uphill battle given the structural factors we talked about before. Um, I do think, Claire Kenny mentioned earlier some of the COVID stuff, right? COVID, it's hard because like there are lots of reasons why COVID may have been part of the reason that the polls were fairly off. And if the polls were off um, because of COVID, they might be off in particular on reasons about COVID or related to COVID. You know, I do think that um, at some point when the pandemic is over, Democrats might want to do a little autopsy of like, what was our messaging like around COVID? How come this wasn't more of a success for us? Right. Um, Because there is like, I know I mentioned this on the show before, right? Like I thought like, um, you know, democratic messaging around some of the protests where all of a sudden they were like, okay, well, this is really important. So, um, so wear a mask, but like, it's important to do this. Right. And that was really a shift from what people have been saying kind of before the protests broke out in May and June. Right. I think some of the democratic scolding around like people wanting to go, um, 
eat Thanksgiving with their families, right? Where it's like, if you do this, you're kind of a monster, right? And I totally agree from like a public health point of view, you know, having travel to see a family for Thanksgiving was a really bad idea. Um, but I think like if Democrats thought that messaging would be effective, right? Um, then I think they are like in a little bit of a bubble, sort of be cliched about that. Um, but, you know, I mean, it is like a problem for Democrats. I think that like um, they are kind of now the party of the educated elites and all the kind of educated elites talk to one another. And there may not be kind of any breaks on people saying, hey, look, actually, this message that you're all in love with, actually, it's going to come across really poorly to like the quote unquote average American or something. Right. But it's it's tricky. It's tricky when you have a party that on the one hand is more diverse than the GOP, right? On the other hand, though, um, maybe suffers from a fair bit of groupthink. So I, let me, I'm going to zone him specifically on Pelosi and Biden picked all the candidates. Biden won the primary. The, the moderate, centrist, whatever, won the primary. Pelosi, Chuck Schumer picked all the candidates in most of the races. They ran on the Pelosi-Schumer platform. The, you know, as my, as when I, I talked to somebody today who said, the platform was a noun, a verb, pre-existing conditions. Like, they ran on the healthcare message. They ran on the Trump is aberrant message. The Pelo- it is really hard to me to blame AOC and the activists for defunding the police who did not get built millions, hundreds of millions of dollars went into the Pelosi, Biden, Schumer strategy. Surely, I'm just skeptical we can blame all the losses on activists who said defund the police and three House members. Like, it's some, the Pelosi, Biden, I, I said this during the DNC to you, Galen, seems like they're not focused on Latinos, black people who care about non-criminal justice issues and lo- and sort of lower middle class white people. It seems like the convention is a big vote for, jo- you know, big John, K- you know, how many John Kasichs and Cindy McCain's do they feature? How many people do they, they talk about black people only in the context of CJ reform? I, I think it's hard, like to me, it's like, the, it's like hard to look at Pelosi's leadership and what she's done and the issues prioritized and been like, it's AOC's fault. And that's kind of what I feel like these last few weeks have been. Like Pelosi had hundreds of millions of dollars and years to develop this message and it's not working. Right. It's a messaging problem. I mean, the, the but not pro- of the left of the center is what I'm suggesting. It's not if, of the the people who have all the money and power are driving the message, not three House members and some activists. But these are really culturally liberal people, right? I mean, Pelosi is extremely culturally liberal. Is she? Is she is she's from California. I don't think. I mean, is she really demanding people say Latinx? I don't think she's doing any. I mean, she's running a pretty pre-existing editions cam. I mean, I don't. I don't know that she's acting on that. I think what I was suggesting before, when I brought up the Bernie Sanders post-2016 focus on, okay, what, what message in the party works? It's the economic message that people like. It's the healthcare message that people like. That stuff feels like it's gone a bit by the wayside because of the, I don't know, the national conversation that's been spiked by a lot of crazy stuff, particularly in, in the 2020 election year. But the Sanders, the Sanders kind of like, okay, what's worked for Democrats since FDR? Uh, a, a, like a broad, like a big economic message that appeals to a lot of people who fall under the same, um, you know, umbrella of I'm working class and I need help with these certain things. I mean, like FDR worked and became an icon because he brought people from different regions and from different races in a way that hasn't really knitted together very often throughout the 20th and 21st century in America. I mean, people should do more exacting analysis on this. I do think one thing, by the way, is that like the fact that healthcare was like the 10th or 11th most visible issue versus the midterm where it was the most visible issue, I think was harmful for Democrats, right? Clearly people um, don't trust the GOP on healthcare and that can turn out Democratic votes. Um, I don't know, though. I, you know, maybe I'm trying to uh, be contrary to your mild contrarianism, Perry, but I do think there's evidence that, like, that, like, the more liberal members of the Democratic caucus underperform more, right? So Kara Eastman, for example, in Nebraska's second district, lost by four and a half points. That's a district that Joe Biden won by, like, six points, right? So a lot of ticket splitting there, and she was someone who was 
very progressive in a sort of moderate district, right? Susan Collins, who won, I mean, Susan Collins is very moderate. Um, she overperformed in ways that you might expect from someone who disagreed with Trump, you know, per our Trump score half the time or something like that. Um, so I don't know. I think I think um, this left right stuff's actually underrated. <laughs> a bit, I'm not suggesting kind of... that, li- that people should run on the AOC message in swing districts. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is the volume of the logical extension of the arguments that people are giving is three congressmen should never speak unless they pull the issues they're going to speak on first in Abigail Spanberger's district and determine they're popular. The defund the police activists should pull it in Abigail Spanberger's district first and determine if they should say it. I think that's what I'm getting. It is not, nobody's expecting anybody to run in Eastman's district. The demand seems to me to shut up unless you, uh, unless you hold views that will be a capital in Abigail Spanberger's district. And everybody on the left is not, pl- everybody for that matter, everybody in journalism, everybody in writing is not like the national discourse is Nancy, everybody's not a politician trying to reach 51% of people. And I think that's the danger of these kinds of arguments. It gets into, don't write about reparations. Tom Cotton might mention it. Like we had the president of the United States attacking the 1619 project. That might have worked electorally. Should Nicole not do her pieces? I mean, that's the danger of this kind of every electoralism takes over everything. It's interesting, though. I mean, I think the, yeah, the big piece here that we haven't talked about as fully is is media, right? Media is a huge player in American politics and the fact that most people now get their news from national sources and are disconnected from local reporting more and more and like local opinion column writing, things like that. That's a huge factor, which, which allows Trump to turn things like the 1619 project, or I guess it's a slightly different category, but then, you know, the NFL kneeling, things like that turn into these litmus tests Right. Which which, you know, in turn, make everything in American in American culture uh, Republican or Democratic. And the, so I think like it's it's it always feels like, you know, you have to tag on like and like the decimation of regional media. But it's a huge part of it. And like and not perhaps not talked enough about it, where it's like literally everyone is getting their news from national sources. And that obviously has an effect on people. Well, and also, I just want to say, Perry, I don't think anybody here is saying what the Democratic Party should or shouldn't do. It's more describing a scenario in which Democrats can't win uh, the parts of the country that would be likely to give them a majority in the Senate. And so, like, it is what it is. And activists and politicians can do whatever they want. Um, But in a party that's led by and large, like, for example, Democrats can't really gain any more ground in a lot of the urban areas in the country. They've basically maxed them out. So their options would be like, do things that potentially piss off uh, the people that they've already gained a bunch of ground with in order to, you know, gain ground with people in more rural and more red or more purple states um, or continue pursuing the path that they're on. I mean, I think they'll most likely continue pursuing the path that they're on. Um, I guess I'm saying Democrats are already doing what you're saying, like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi are running this campaign. I think if you're saying that they're not getting the attention that they should, or other people are getting more attention, the only way those people get less attention is if they stop talking, I guess, is functionally, that's what I'm getting at, is like the, all the, the you know, that's kind of, it, it, the, it is the logical extension of this argument does get close to, don't write your reparations piece, Tom Cotton will take advantage of it and tell people in South Dakota. That's kind of what I'm pushing at, because I, I've read some of these arguments, and that's, Kind of, they often, often are, not my colleagues here, but often like, sounds like black people should shut up until we poll their views first and figure out if they're popular in North Dakota. I think my question is the opposite, which is so more like, okay, when was the last time you heard a Democrat who was vocally opposed to third trimester abortion run for office? When was the last time you heard a Democrat with like- I assume Joe Manchin is, right? Bob Casey? I don't really know. And if he is, he is an extreme outlier and not very vocal, right? So the question is, like, do Democrats want to embrace some culturally conservative things and be vocal about them? I mean, Biden said, I don't support defunding the police every day, right? Biden said, I don't support defunding the police literally every speech he gave, right? I mean, I think some of this, again, goes back to it's not even about the substance of people's views within the party. It's about the perceptions and the messaging. So a thing 
that I think Republicans have been successful about is making a certain subset of the American population think that there are, you know, a plurality or a majority of Democrats in Congress who do believe in defunding the police, right? Like a lot of this is about the appearance of the thing is more important than the thing itself. And this is probably a perennial problem in America, but the, the American public isn't actually getting the right impression of a party's views. So Max Rose... Uh, lost the House race in Staten Island, so you know, so one of the five boroughs. I was trying a more conservative one than the you know than Manhattan. So he went to a um, BLM rally, you know, during he went to a great he went to one of these rallies or went to the, one of the protests about George Floyd's death. He voted for the fairly moderate House bill about you know banning chokeholds. The Republicans ran against him and said, you support defunding the police. You are anti-police. Now, if I were Max Rose, knowing where we are in American politics, I might have not gone to the George Floyd rally because the gap between I support black people very enthusiastically and I support defunding the police is a narrow, is, is one that's hard to nuance. And if I'm running in Staten Island, I might have tried to avoid both. It's like... It's hard to ignore the sort of like, you should be for racial justice really strongly, except don't use the slogan of the people who are out there for racial justice is complicated because voters might get the impression you agree with their the most radical claims too. So, I mean, isn't a lot of this like one party carries all the black people? What you... Yeah. One the the black 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 yeah. views are unpopular. Black people push their the black activist views are particularly unpopular. One party carries them all. That makes them unpopular. Are we sort of that's a part of what's going on here? I think a lot of elite white opinion is pretty unpopular, and I think as that well, there also, are a lot sure. of, and I think that there are um, a lot of like you know if you pull black Democrats, you'll see that a lot of them don't agree with activists either. So like, I think that across the board, elites and activists um, uh, within the Democratic Party who are white, black, or, you know, anything, do hold views and are, are vocal about their views that don't jibe well with the, I guess, majority of the Democratic Party that's, for example, like not college educated. But Joe Biden felt pressure to go to the protests because he thought the, he embraced the protests because he felt the majority of the Democratic Party embraced the general goal of the protests. But if you're trying to win the median white person, maybe that's unwise. But it's like you can't be worth 78 percent for racial justice, but the other 22 percent were not for voters might get the impression it's not surprising. Some voters think that you might be for defund the police if you show up at all the same protest that defund the police people pay but you say i'm not even the police but you're for uh, the rest of their agenda like yes joe biden is for 85 percent of the activist agenda not the other 15 it's a fairly nuanced thing to say that yeah, he's closer I, I to the I, activist I, position and the median black position than the average republican is i don't know why you know that's oh, yes. oh i think that's i think that's 100 percent true but I think that just the challenges for the Democratic Party run deeper. Can we do a what's wrong with the Republican Party conversation next week, maybe? They did lose the yeah. presidency. They did lose <laughs> the House. They may lose the Senate. I think I'm, what you're hearing from me is like the people who are for defunding the police are not doing polls. They are trying to change a country in which unarmed black people get killed too often. Having three weeks in which they get blamed for Donald Trump, it seems a little bit strained and that's what i'm frustrated with is like the activists do not need to poll can you imagine in 1964 and 1968 if we had been like martin luther king said this but the polls say he's unpopular oh my god can anyone speak in america without them being polled on and told to shut up unless their views poll okay can i bring up a, a historical example yes. just which i think kind of shows how much we've been having the same uh I guess, messaging arguments in American politics for basically 50 years. I have been taking a little bit of a step back from like the, <laughs> the political internet. And one of the things, um, like a person I'm really interested in as a historical uh, politician is Carl Stokes, who is the first black mayor of a major American city, Cleveland, Ohio. And I was reading Carl Stokes's autobiography, which is really interesting and is basically all about... Um, ethnic coalitions and his whole thing is like 
American politics is all has always been about ethnic coalitions and like the whites figured it out in big American cities. And my innovation was I made black politics an ethnic part of the ethnic coalition politics. And he talks about in his, I think maybe the first time he ran for mayor in 1965 or 66, Martin Luther, it was a huge national story. And Martin Luther King and all these other national black leaders really wanted to come to Cleveland and like support Carl Stokes. And Stokes had to have these like really difficult conversations with King where he was basically like, don't come to Cleveland. I need to win the white races. Um, please don't come. And he goes through this thing and, and King ends up coming, but they have these like really intricate agreements about like what kind of what kind of actions King can take and what kind he won't take and who he'll meet with and who he won't meet with. And it's really interesting because it's all about like, you know, Carl Stokes was a pretty progressive guy, but also this this pragmatist who knew he had to he had to win not just the white liberals on the east side suburbs, but also the white racists on the west side suburbs. And so it does like to Perry's point, it's it does become like a frustration of the black politician in particular. I mean, this like Carl Stokes's autobiography is such an interesting read because he is angry, right? He's angry that he <laughs> that he has to do that. And he's very honest about it. And he's very honest about the politicking. Like it's really an interesting look. And it's like we are having the exact same conversations. And this is in like, you know, the mid 1960s. So it, so I just thought that was so interesting because like MLK was to, to Carl Stokes, an activist that he had to deal with, right? Like, and, and you know, he does, he writes, he writes this after King dies. So obviously, you know, he, there's a sense of like, oh my God, I had to say this to, to Martin Luther King Jr. But I thought it was so interesting because it, it basically shows how longstanding all these dynamics are. Anyway. And the final thing I would say in this, I guess is I've been too flustered by this. It has went on too long, but White liberals are moving to the left on racial issues. I'm not going to, I'm not going to keep criticizing, I'm not going to criticize them for that. I'm grateful that some of them are doing that. Those are things that are going to help the country overall, I would suggest. So to lecture them and say they're becoming too culturally liberal, I mean, the fact that white people are out there protesting in June and July is, is a very important thing. And we can isolate their culturalism on, on a thousand issues, but the issue that is dividing the country it's not that all Republicans are racist, or even most of them are. It's that we have differing views about what the racial status quo of the country is and how it should change. And that doesn't mean that if you don't support BLM that you're a racist. It just, but it does mean that racial attitudes are a center part of politics. And I worry we're getting close to the demand being if you speak honestly about racial attitudes and the way you feel and they're not popular in Abigail Spanberger's district, and I, and I say that to, about white politicians or black ones or, you know, or Asian ones or what have you, is that it's, it, you, you do have to think a little bit of like, if would this critique I'm giving apply to MLK pretty precisely? Did he help Nixon win in 68? Were his politics unpopular? And, and if they were, then it's worth thinking about, is that exactly the critique I want to make of people? As a journalist, I think people should do whatever they want. But in terms of analyzing what effects that has on politics, I think that's totally fair game. And like, yes, because a lot of our politics is racially motivated, that having a large national conversation about race is sure to influence politics. Um, let me let me say, let me bring one thing up just to throw a wrench in everyone's works, right? If you look at Gallup polling on what the most important issues were for people, then by far the most important issue is coronavirus, which is 30%. The government slash poor leadership, so basically referendum on Trump was 23%, right? And then you kind of have the economy and race relations tied for for third um, at around 10% each. Should we maybe, to the extent Democrats, and they won the election, right? They won the presidency, right? To the extent they didn't win by more, um, or to the extent they saw their majority of the House contract, right? Maybe we should look toward what was their messaging on COVID, on the economy, and about Trump. And those, you know, I don't, I don't know, I, 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 I don't know that we should assume that Democrats' messaging on race hurt them. It may have helped them, um, and it may not have been as 
important as they're messaging on COVID, given that three times as many people cited COVID as the most important issue to them in this Gallup poll. All right. Well, I don't think we have uh, black and white answers, um, but this is definitely interesting to discuss and analyze. And I think we should take Nate's suggestion that next week we talk about the challenges that the Republican Party is facing, which, you know, doesn't seem to be able to get a majority support nationally, not in this election, but also in many of the elections over the past three decades. So we can dig into those challenges as well. But let's leave it there for now. So thank you, Nate, Claire, and Perry. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. My name is Galen Druk. Tony Chow is in the virtual control room. Claire Bidigary Curtis is on audio editing. You can get in touch by emailing us at podcasts at 538.com. You can also, of course, tweet at us with any questions or comments. If you're a fan of the show, leave us a rating or a review in the Apple Podcast Store or tell someone about us. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you soon.